Sender, hello. Hey. Hi. Hi, Tim. Hi. I spoke to Casey Rias. <laughs> yes, I saw you were a bit starstruck. <laughs> completely. I feel completely overwhelmed by that. That was really, really nice. And especially his words about our work, right? So it's, it's, I mean, it must be so cool for him to see that processing. I mean, he just built this foundation and people like you and Vera and the others just use that to create amazing stuff. Um, not just in a way that it appears on websites, but also in real projects. And that's, by the way, is why uh, one of the reasons why I think your work is extremely inspiring for the community, right? So you can tell us a little bit about how to use creative coding in a real uh, environment, right? So um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, really, really cool to see uh, to see Casey it was. Uh... A bit of a shame that I couldn't see everything because I was still walking around with a four-month-old uh, baby at the time. Ah, really? But okay. uh, wow, they're all in bed, so I'm uh, I'm I'm here now. But uh, yeah, cool to hear that. I mean, it's of course also his vision on why he created processing that we do what we do. So it's, it, I mean, I see also him like as my hero who who made this software that uh, that that made sure that I am where I am now. But it's also nice to hear that you know he also looks. At, at us, yeah, maybe not me specifically, but at you and, and, and like the whole community yeah. in the same way and sees his vision come alive. So super Absolutely. exciting. I think, I think this is the really, really cool thing about processing, right? It's not just the software that just does so many cool things. It's the community. I mean, through processing, I met you. I met, you know, Vera, Cyril. Um, I mean, so many people that just came into my life through processing. This is probably the most valuable outcome of the whole efforts I put into the uh, into to my teaching and my uh, content right so yeah you I also really see it with, when I mean when people code or when you talk about code it's always people wanting to share what they made or if someone has a question I mean there there's a reason why there's so many forums and and platforms yeah. to to learn about coding or to have people explaining things or like you making tutorials for for free or you know um, writing books or it's because people are really enthusiastic about this. I mean, I'm too. That's why I always like talking about this, uh, these things, and that that creates, of course, uh, a really nice community. So, yes, happy absolutely. to be a part of it. Absolutely, I'm super happy that you that you are here. So that's really amazing. Studio Dumber, you are the creative coder at Studio Dumber, and I guess you are going to speak a little bit about that in your talk. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, we do. We do a bit more talks at Studio Dunbar, and this time I mm -hmm. made it a little bit differently because normally we just, you know, we choose some projects that make sense for the topic that we can talk about. Um, and a lot of the projects we do actually involve processing in, 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 in sort of way. Like it's not always the same way, but I will show, well, it's, let me say this, the, the, the talks it has, is, is, is two parts. Mm -hmm. For one, because it's about processing me in 20 years, I thought it would be nice to just share really quickly how I got to the place where I am now. Also, because mm -hmm. that's the question I get asked the most, like, hey, you work at Studio Dunbar, how do you become a creative coder at Studio Dunbar? Or, you know, uh, yeah, how can I become a coder in a, in a studio like that? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to really quickly go through that because processing played um, the most important role, I think, in that whole story, uh, how I got there. Um, mm -hmm. But the most part will be projects where we have used processing or where I've used processing just to show different ways of how we incorporate coding in general, but mostly processing mm -hmm. um, yeah, in the daily projects that we do. So it, it's in all kinds of different levels. You know, sometimes it's, it's the sketching, the experimenting. Some, sometimes it's actually the applied version where we create a tool to generate something. Something is Sometimes it's like a, almost like a race between After Effects and, and coding to see which, in the end, which, which, which will perform best. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will just show some different examples and, and dive into why we've used processing and, and maybe that sheds some light on people also want to do creative coding, but maybe in a more applied uh, uh, sense yeah, or in a more you know, mainstream uh, graphic design yeah. environment. Hopefully, yeah, sure. Um, but maybe before you start your talk, because we still have a few minutes and I want people yeah, sure. that just attend at the right time uh, have the chance to see the whole talk. You live in Amsterdam, right? Sorry? So, you live in Amsterdam, is that right? Uh, well, Studio Dunbar is actually in Rotterdam. I heard you saying Amsterdam before, which is, uh, ah. I mean, it, it, we are part of uh, part of Debt, which is uh, almost like a global, I think right now it's like a global uh, digital agency. 
-hmm. within that we're still studio dunbar and we're like our own uh, little island in it but uh Dept has offices in amsterdam and rotterdam but we are we've always been uh, in rotterdam and also a bit in the hague but uh so yeah i live near uh, rotterdam okay okay i thought you are from amsterdam you're living in amsterdam okay Cool, but I mean, in Netherlands, okay. everything is very close, so you can walk to Amsterdam in two minutes, I guess. That's that's true. <laughs> they call uh, Amsterdam and Rotterdam and the Hague together. It's called like the Randstad, which is like you know one big municipality uh -huh. almost because it's so close. I've been wondering what Randstad means because I read this all the time. Okay, I guess it's like half of the Netherlands, I think, around half the Netherlands lives in the like near the Randstad. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe I'm saying false things, but so but how. Do I mean, did did you study something or did you make a professional training? How did you get into this this thing? I don't know if this is a company That's a part of the presentation I will give. Okay, I won't. I, won't. I, won't. <laughs> I think we it's can start with It's not interesting because it's just like how I got into coding. But I think it, in this case, because it's specifically about processing being 28, that I want to share it a, a little bit more. But yeah, I did. I mean, I did study somewhere and got into mm -hmm. coding then, but it's... It's, it, it's like 14 years ago that I started studying. It was quite a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have been on and off processing for most of it. So mm -hmm. like recently, the last two years, I've been you know, really into creative coding again. But the years before, I, I kind of didn't have the, the time or you know, it wasn't really a big part of, of what I did. Okay. But it all started uh, yeah, in, when I was studying. Okay. So I guess... If you want, we can start. I will switch off my video now and uh, my microphone. Sure. And then the stage, I would say the stage is yours. Maybe you try first to share your screen that we can see if it works. Yes. Um, let me share the correct screen. How's this? Yes. Yes, it works. I see a video. I don't know if that's the full screen of your presentation. I think so. Okay, okay, great. Nice. All right. So, bye bye. See you in a few minutes. Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let me get this on the right screen, otherwise, I don't see anything. All right. So uh, yeah, thank you, Tim, uh, again for inviting me. I don't see you anymore. I don't see anyone. So it's like talking to a to a screen. But I just believe that there are people there. If you're watching this live, welcome. If you're watching this later, when I'm uh, famous, then uh, this is where it all started. Um, so first of all, congratulations to um, to processing twenty years. I already said to Tim before we started this presentation that uh, I've like twenty years is is like for me processing has been a big part of my professional career and my my education for like for, uh, more than 14 years so a big part of this 20 year is uh, is also a bit my uh, my journey um but yeah welcome i'm sam Sturing. i'm a creative coder um sorry i keep putting my mouse on the screen um and uh, sorry sander one yeah. thing i guess we don't see your presentation i'm not sure oh. we just see a video uh Maybe you shared the wrong screen. I'm not really sure. Uh, that's classic. Okay, wait, give me yeah. one second. Yeah, that's this zoom, zoom thing, right? Yeah, it's when I start sharing something, I don't see anything anymore. Wait, give me one. Sorry, sorry. No worries. I've worries. been in. I'm, I mean, I'm in Zoom meetings the whole day, so you would think mm -hmm. I would know how to share something. Uh, maybe then I can't share the. Okay, I guess that's not working. What I wanted to do then. Oh. Uh, I was playing my keynote in Windows mode and wanted to share that, but apparently Zoom doesn't see it. So I will just do it full screen and then. Uh, share it like that. Then the problem is that I don't see my notes. Ah, okay, I get it. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, but oh well. Let's uh, let's just do it like this. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry for this. Confusion. So the chat, Cyril screams sender and sends an heart. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Cyril. Glad that you're here. 
Yeah. Okay, then I will do it like this. How's this? So we see a video, but I'm okay. That looks yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. I'm the stage. So sorry, I will uh, not start completely over again, but I will do a quick intro again. <laughs> sorry for the confusion. Nice. I don't see my notes anymore, so so if I forget something, then uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, so processing twenty years, um, which I'm really happy about. I'm Sam Sturing. I'm a creative coder at Studio Dunbar, and I want to share some projects that we do at Studio Dunbar, or I uh, specifically do as a creative coder where creative coding comes into play in a lot of different ways, um, which I will go to a little bit later. But before that, because processing is 20 years, I also wanted to share a little bit of my story and how I got into this role, because that's the question uh, I already mentioned to Tim that, that people ask me the most when I do a presentation. It's like, how do you end up as a creative coder in a, in a graphic design studio or a branding studio? Um, because that's not maybe a role that all, the, all these kind of studios have. So I just want to share really quickly how I got there and um, yeah, then go into some projects and show how we use processing in a daily basis. Uh, really quickly, a little bit about me. I have been coding uh, for a long time, but most recently, like two years ago, I started uh, doing uh, a bit more coding again. I really love grids, mostly because I really like to have full control over what I code. And I, I'm not really this experimental guy who does all these weird little things. I really want to know what I'm going to make and, and keep everything under my control. So I really love grids. Uh, as you can see here, I love working with image input and uh, I don't know, just putting everything in a grid. Again, grids, I love them. Uh, the other thing that I maybe love a li little bit more about, uh, uh, more than grids, is noise. Um, I don't know why, but this, this, because noise is so actually it's quite a technical thing and quite a, you know, you have these full uh, reports written about in these white papers about the, the maths behind it and, and how they work. Um, but at the same time, it feels so alive and, and almost like a, like a fluid um, biological uh, uh, thing. And I like this combination of this really technical thing that, you know, gives this really soothing animations to look at. This is one of the things I made with noise a couple of, uh, a month ago that I still use as a basis for a lot of the things I do. And I, I don't know, I can look at this. Uh, this is one of the favorite things I ever made. It's just some black and white uh, blocks moving, but I don't know why, but I can look at this the whole day. So I made a 45 minute version of this. So if you're interested in a 60 gigabytes video file of uh, this, please let me know. Um, recently I also bought a plotter, so there's a lot of sounds, but um, yeah, I don't know. Now I can take things not only on my screen, but put them in real life. If you want to buy a print, please uh, give me a shout out on Instagram. And something I also really like to do in coding is coll collaborating with other people because I'm actually not that good of a designer. Um, and I really like to work with other people. So this is uh, me working with Dan Riedbergen, who is an ex-colleague of mine and he works with typography he makes his own type so this is one of his typefaces and the nice thing is that he works really in an analog way he's like a, a street art kind of uh, uh, guy but his fonts really you know speak to me in, a, in like they're, they're really easy to work with in code so we do these experiments together and you know make these nice little animations more to come um, so there's also a little bit of sound here but uh, this is another uh, collaboration I did with Jonathan Castro, which is almost like the other side of the spectrum of uh, designers. He is like this, this almost crazy in a positive way, uh, a designer who makes this this really experimental, over the top uh, graphics. And I I also know him from Studio Dunbar before, and we worked on this project together where we made this visualizer for uh, for an album, um, and to, together with paintings uh, um, by a really good painter, we yeah we we. we made these, these, uh, these crazy animations. They're all based on the stuff you see on the right. Like I gave him this input and he used that in his video uh, to generate these officials. And the nice thing about working at Studio Dunbar is um, that I get to collaborate every day with, the, with uh, some of the most uh, amazing designers I know. So I made this not with Pedro, as you might think, but with Stan, uh, who is the official designer at Studio. We made this for Pedro, who was another designer at Studio who left, uh, who left the studio, unfortunately. And this was actually projected on a huge wall somewhere in Colombia. I saw someone in the chat before from Colombia. So here you go. This was in Colombia. 
Uh, and also this is, uh, for example, a uh, collaboration I did with Elvin, a motion designer. So for me, it's really important to work with other people because I'm quite a technical guy and I know something about design, but I really need other people to, um, yeah, to make uh, nice results. But almost like in a movie, when you see uh, something happening and then you see uh, the 40 years earlier, how did I get here? I'm going through this really quickly because, you know, it's maybe not that interesting, but I don't know, I want to share it anyway. Um, so 40 years ago, I started to studying. It was in a time where you still had this really big plastic iMacs and uh, plastic uh, laptops. And at the time, I didn't really know what to study. I, I, I wanted to do graphic design, but I knew nothing about design. And the one problem was that I had a horrible portfolio. It was not really a portfolio. It was like a collection of random things that I, I did. I didn't know anything about design, but I always tried out some programs. So I did a little bit of like 3D things. This is something I found on my old hard drive. So this was actually in my portfolio to become a graphic designer. And I had some flash animations, like all kinds of random things. Um, but the luck was that the year before they started another study called Information and Interactive Media Design next to the graphic design uh, uh, study to make sure that at that time there were a lot of graphic designers, but the whole design scene moved a little bit and there were so more uh, such a lot more ways of designing so a lot more techn te yeah, technology like processing but also uh, you know uh, yeah w they just needed other types of designers and for me this came as a blessing because i came with this horrible portfolio but because i had all these 3d things and 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 stuff that they saw hey he can work with computers maybe this is something from him and this study was quite new so they wanted to get, to get as many people as possible so uh, so even i got in and the nice thing in that study was, is that we had some amazing teachers with, they were all quite young uh, people who recently graduated and were all working in this field of technology uh, uh, combined with, with art or design. So this, for example, worked from Catalog Tree, uh, yeah, Cadillac Tree, and um, uh, Joris Malta and, uh, and Daniel Gross. And actually they introduced processing to, to us, to me, to the, to, the, to the class. I never coded anything before I, I went to the study but they were the ones who uh, who got me excited about about processing like 14 13 years ago there were also some other teachers like Richard Feig and you see his work, work on the right or uh, Lust Studio like a lot of people who work at Lust that sadly doesn't exist anymore well they, they are uh, partly they exist now in, in uh, open render um, but they make this huge interactive installation so we had this amazing teachers who were teaching us these things and I yeah came uh, to know the world of coding and processing in, in particular, which I yeah, before never knew anything about. So this is me with a, with a, a classmate of mine, Tima. Uh, and from that point on, because we, I knew processing and I, I fell in love with it so much that I, I just started coding the whole day. So every project we got, even though I was still not a really good designer and I did an art academy, I, I just coded everything that I could. So, you know, if we had to make a poster with uh, about the Netherlands, I coded it. If we had some kind of data set or we had to have a free project or we got a, a list of, of books or, yeah, it doesn't matter, uh, I coded it. And yes, on the right, you do, you do see uh, come and semen drinking guys. I don't know why. It was in the text. So when we were asked to make a flag for Europe, or if we were asked to, uh, you know, to do something with a big archive of uh, recently scanned text, I, I don't know, I just coded everything. It was not always the right decision or like a really nice end project, but in the end, I learned so much about coding. I got better and better. I, I there was also most of the time like a kind of like a, a good concept behind it. So in the end, processing actually helped me through school because still. I was not really a good designer, but I was still managing to uh, to make it through uh, through the art academy. And even up until the the day we were, or not the day, but maybe the, the, the time we were graduating, me and Tima were working on this game in processing instead of graduating because we loved processing so much. We, we really wanted to make a game in it. And we made this crazy game that's actually still kind of in development, but it has been silent for 12 years. Uh, it's called VSD, which stands for virtual space drug, because we wanted to make a really addicting game and it has all kinds of addicting features in it. All the names of the weapons, for example, are based on, a, on a street names for drugs. Anyway, this was while we were actually supposed to be graduating, we were making these things just be, because we loved, you know, uh, processing and, and coding so much. In the end, I actually graduated. I, at the time I was learning Japanese or trying to learn Japanese and I was really into this kanji uh, uh, character set that they use 
and I was reading about this professor who uh, dissected all these characters into smaller versions and something about this combination of uh, you know this nice written Japanese characters combined with the the, the structure and the systematics of this this uh, of this system really spoke to me so I made this kind of cloud with all these layers of different kinds of characters that were connected to each other and um, at that time touch screens were really cool uh, so I had this huge touch screen it's like 11 years ago so you know uh, we just had iPhones and stuff so touch screens were a really hip thing and I put it on a touch screen and uh, yeah, I don't know. You could go through all of this uh, stuff and you know see all kinds of characters. So even my graduation project was, of course, made in processing, like my whole school. So in the end, thank you, processing, for making me uh, pass uh, art the art academy. Um, but then came the time because I was graduating that I started that that I had to work. And I, you know, you would think maybe he will start somewhere where he could do processing, but that was actually not the case because at that time you. There were some places where they, you know, where you could do processing as a daytime job, but it was, or it, it, it felt a little bit like a niche uh, uh, thing still. So it were studios who did installations or who did like data visualizations, but they were relatively small studios or new studios, not really looking for people. Like if I typed in creative coder in a, uh, uh, you know, or something that, that was the term back then in, in, a, in a job search, you know, nothing pops up. But there were a lot of graphic design studios at that time looking for creative people who could also technically make something, mostly websites. So I started working in this amazing place called Silo. I've worked there for five years. Um, I never <laughs> coded a website before, but I got hired as a, as a developer for websites and a, and a, and a, a web designer. Um, I learned a lot there. It, it was a really nice, uh, nice time. I, yeah, like I said, I've been there for four or five years. Um, but then suddenly, you know, I had to make websites. So I, I designed websites. I did these workshops about uh, technical requirements and, and frameworks and all that, uh, all that nonsense. Um, I built websites, which I, like I said, I never did before. I made, made wireframes. So I was completely into this website business. Um, and actually, I mean, I really liked my job. I really liked being there. And, and it, it was a really cool place to be. But I really missed this feeling that I had in the art school, like this, this, um, you know, this experimenting, this this free time, or just this this motivation to make whatever we wanted. Um, just this idea popping into a mind, and then whole evenings and days just spending on it, even while we were supposed to graduate, and you know, in the evening uh, uh, trying to code this game, but just be, because we loved it so much. So now we do a lot of talks. When I, now that I work to the dumb, I do a lot of talks for students, and the question that I get asked the most is, a hey, uh, I also learned a little bit about coding or I want to learn about coding. Should I do it? And my answer is always yes. Not only about coding, but if you have something that you want to learn and you have the ability to learn it, like you have the, you have the time, you have the, you know, the resources to do it at that time, mostly when you're a student, you know, please do it because I, yeah, I, I sometimes regret that I didn't uh, uh, took all out of the time that I, uh, that I had when I was uh, studying for example, we, we we started doing things with Arduino and stuff, and I never really went through with it. So anytime someone asks me to do, uh, you know, should I should I learn this or I'm interested in this? Do you think I should invest time? Yes, always do it because it will always benefit you. Um, yeah, so that's just a piece of advice that you can. I don't know, it's free. Um, and luckily, in the end, or like nearing the end of my time at Silo Day. Uh, the studio um, evolved a little bit into uh, doing a lot of work for uh, architects. So branding uh, buildings from the inside, like making big graphics on walls or making um, uh, um, like signage. And then I could sneak in a little bit of processing again. So after a couple of years, I started up processing for the first time again. And I, together with the designers, made these kind of things where they would draw something and I would make patterns with it or uh, these kind of stuff. So. Um, yeah, that that lighted the spark a little again, uh, a little bit again. That I thought, hey, I can use processing in a professional environment. Like I don't have to go to a specific studio that has creative coding as you know as one of their their uh, job descriptions or one of their outcomes. I, I can actually use it in you know the studios I work in. So this was a little bit at the end of Silo. Uh, then I went to Studio Dunbar because uh, yeah, I worked for four or five years, and they gave me the opportunity to go here, which I did. Um, a real quick intro about Studio Dunbar, just so you all know uh, what it is before I will go into some projects. 
were actually founded in 1977, so we're even older than processing. There are around 17 to, uh, to 20 people, it changes around a little bit, from all over the world. And we focus on identity and uh, also the recent years more and more on motion. This is us on a cake in a Zoom meeting. And this is where we come from. This is the, one of the first logos ever designed by Ged Dunbar, the founder of the studio is the, the logo of the trains. It's nice to see that it's still on the train. So it's one of the oldest logos still in use, I think. And Studio Dunbar is known for branding throughout the years. For example, we did the police and we did uh, stuff like Transavia. Um, we do not only brand vehicles. There's just, I don't know, these examples uh, are just nice to show on a photo, but we do all kinds of uh, uh, branding. And we still do that even after... 43 years but the method we do it changed quite a bit especially the the recent years um and one of the reasons is this statement this almost like this this motto that we now use in the studio it's it's uh, a quote from our creative director uh, lisa lisa Enabis. um because these brands i mean we still you know do branding we still make visual identities for these brands but these brands have moved to a whole new playing field where um, you know, where they move from one platform to the other, it, they have to adapt to all kinds of sizes, to different uh, types of media, to, um, you know, they have to work on a small scale, big scale, uh, in motion, in, in a short time period. And, well, it's, it's just different than putting a logo uh, on a train. Um, so for us, this really became our, you know, bane of existence to, to, to say static is not the option. We should really go into motion and make things uh, dynamic. And for me, the big change came with this uh, uh, orchestra, which is called the Amsterdam Sinfonietta. We've been working for them at that point for like 15, 20 years. And what we did is every season we made uh, uh, all their posters for their concerts. And there was another designer always uh, um, in charge of designing the, the posters. So here you see, you know, a couple of them. And at that time, they said, hey, we have this identity, but it's actually quite static. It's this logo always in the top, but we need something that's a lot more dynamic because, you know, we make music. They do a lot of experimental things where they work with other types of, um, of artists or with, with uh, official artists even. So they wanted to include this dynamic and experimental thing in their identity. And we were sketching on this identity. We were trying things in motion, but... It didn't really work out the way we wanted. They were the designers were wanted to have this, yeah, this sense of uh, dynamity, this 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 um, this energy of the music in in identity. And yeah, they were trying something. So they they came to me and they said, hey, you know, a little bit of processing. We have this idea of a grid that could move, that we can make move with sound or with video input. Can you make something? And of course, I can because I already said I love uh, I love grids and I love processing. So this was the first project I did in Studio Dumber again really going into coding. This was also a bit a bit of a turning point of my job where I really turned more into a creative coder again. Um, so this yeah, grid is actually quite simple. You can make it move with, uh, with all kinds of input and it comes alive a little bit and you can spell out the text with it. And we wrote a bit of a more advanced tool where you could play around with uh, sizing, with dynamics, with colors, you could type some text. And the nice thing I think about this is um, I, like it was never the goal to make a tool that could generate everything for this identity because I really wanted to keep the, the designers who would actually make the motion and, the, and the, the posters and all the stuff. I wanted to keep them in charge with, um, uh, with making the identity. And if I would only give them this tool and try to make everything in this tool, I would quite limit them. So instead of trying to solve everything in this tool, I, I said, hey, you can give it every kind of input that you want. So uh, they would just make something in After Effects, just, you know, an animation that really fitted the music that, the, that you know, the, the, the poster or the motion piece was about. So they could, you know, really make anything they want. They would make it in black and white. And we would just translate it into, um, yeah, into this grid of letters. And you could pick colors and play around with it. So it's all, almost like a big filter for uh, for these animations. And these are just some first explorations that some of the designers did with this tool. And for me, this was such a nice moment where, you know, you write some, you, you write some code, you give designers a tool, and then you see them working with the code you've written and, and asking you questions, hey, like, uh, I'm trying out this, can you also make it like this? Can you make it go faster? Can you make it uh, do these uh, things? And that's still the energy that we have in all these projects where, you know, 
one person makes something, asks someone else to, hey, can you, can you uh, elaborate on this? And then it's like a ping pong uh, game back and forth. And with this, um, uh, you know, with these two things, so the designers being able to play uh, with this tool and, and the tool itself, we could finally make the identity and that turned out into something like this. Sorry, like this. So there's the there's a new logo. Um, and it gave us opportunities to also, you know, because we had this style, we could suddenly really quickly make all kinds of different types of motion that really fitted uh, the music it was for. So this is a bit more bold and, and powerful. <laughs> something a bit more playful. And this is a bit more emotional and relaxed. Beautiful. Um, and the nice thing also about this is that if we took this stills from this motion that we made from this code, it, it also started to become the uh, like the base of the whole identity. So we could use these and actually sketch with them. Uh, and it yeah, started to become the actual identity. So for us, it was also a new way of working um, where this was actually, you know, at, at the core of the of the identities, this movement and this, uh, this dynamics. So here are just some examples of the things we made, it's like you see uh, from, uh, uh, not so recent, 2018, and we still were able to make the poses. So these are uh, poses here we made by Stan, um, and we still use the system. And the nice thing about this is actually, it. so we still sometimes use processing to make them, but we also evolved a little bit and use, uh, for example, this is not made in processing anymore, but we also use Cinema 4D or After Effects. So in a way, it's nice that we could use processing to do it, but it should never be the goal uh, itself. It's also something that KCV uh, Rias just uh, talked about a, a little bit is, it's never our goal to make something in coding. We just try to find the best tool for the job and the concept of the idea, of course, always comes first. So this idea of this dynamic identity came first and we could suddenly make it in processing, but it doesn't mean that it has to stop there. So from there, because uh, we also got other designers and people having other skills, we suddenly could also evolve it and use other, uh, yeah, like other types of software to to you know to make something in the same concept of ID. So that's something important uh, from our studio. But suddenly this door was open to include processing in our sketching phase, which for me of course was really exciting, but also for the designers because it, it suddenly opened the door to uh, a different way of sketching, a different way of designing things without changing our you know original vision of creating uh, identities. So just a couple of examples that processing has played a role in, in different senses. Uh, the first one I want to show you, I'm not going to go into depth too much about the project because I want to show a couple of projects. And if I go to depth of all of them, we'll sit here for a long time. Um, but Cumulus Park, it's an innovation district in Amsterdam. Um, so it's here, it's a couple of buildings next to each other. And it's like a combination of students and professional people working together. And it's all about innovation. But how do you visualize innovation? So we came up with this um, concept of like things interchanging with each other. Uh, you know, it started out with it starts out with two groups, but um, when things start to mix with each other, you get new shapes, you get new uh, uh, like this new feeling. And uh, we really like this idea. And this is basically the core of the identity. So it's not something static, but even the core of the ident uh, identity is something uh, uh, in motion. Um, and we made this, this is not made in processing. Actually, this was the first sketches we did in After Effects. But then the thing is, if you, when, how we made this in, in After Effects, it was quite cumbersome to, to work with it because you couldn't work in, um, in it like real life. You always had to, um, 
you had to prepare what you wanted to visualize. You had to render out. You had to uh, to wait if if you didn't like it, you had to change something, render out again, and see. So we were having this question: like, can we also make this in code? And of course, we can. Um, so I made this tool that uh, in processing again, where you could play around, could use different kinds of particles. You could change things like uh, you know how it was how it was built up change things like the speed, how many things change at the same time, how far can it go, how fast will they go, stuff like that. And while this is pretty nice, it's a really nice tool, It, in the end, it didn't really cut the same quality as we could do with um, uh, with the animations that we made in, in After Effects. And it's maybe not something uh, that has to do with processing. Maybe it's more that I couldn't fix it in the end. That it was the same, uh, the same feeling. But we, yeah, we liked it. But it, it, it wasn't as good as we, you know, for example, ha um, had here. Especially because we started to make these things where words were changing into each other. So we made this tool. It was really nice to to use. But in the end, a lot of things we made were still made in After Effects, just because you know it was, uh, it it gave a better result. you see here but it was not the end i mean what's nice about having this tool is uh, is that it came into play a little bit later because we also needed to make print work and then suddenly it became quite hard to make a nice still out out of the out of the motion and and use it for print because you want to catch this dynamic you know this feeling of things changing into each other of when they're in the moment of going from one place to another which is quite hard to sketch in a static program like uh, like Illustrate. I mean, you have some plugins that you can make things into grids, but to make it catch a dynamic moment is quite hard. So we still had this tool and then it already could render out PDF. So in the end, we used this tool that I started out writing for the motion part, but in the end, we used it actually mostly for the printing part because you could play around and when it was moving, you would just you know save the frames that you like and then you suddenly had this print ready uh, uh, PDF that you could work with. So a lot of the um, the designs we we put in the buildings are actually you know uh, exported from this uh, this motion tool that we made in in, uh, in processing. So the motion tool became a, became a printing tool, and we yeah created this uh, crazy uh, visuals here on the windows. Also, and a bit of the crown of the work was in one of the uh, one of the early sketches we did. We said, hey, it would also be nice to make this clock. And this is, of course, something which is then again hard to do in motion software because you're not going to make a 24-hour video. So in the end, there's still something in motion running in one of the buildings that we made in processing. So it's this clock that's still uh, going at the moment, and uh, you know, uh, it's made in processing. So it's a bit of the crown uh, on this uh, on this project for me. Um, so the important thing is, you know, choose the best tool for the job. I mean. I thought I could solve it in processing. In the end, we we decided, you know, uh, quality-wise, for us, After Effects works better. Um, but then again, this tool became the, the best tool for the printing job. So uh, it's a bit the same advice as before, you know, uh, uh, coding is never the goal itself. And that goes for all the, the, the skills we use in studio. It's never the, the goal to use a certain skill, but we just, you know, try to keep, uh, to use the best tool for the job. Another project um, where processing played a, quite a small role in, but I think uh, the outcome is, is pretty nice. We worked for Adidas Future Natural, which is a new type of shoe. Um, the identity is this crazy motion world where all this, uh, this little animations uh, come to life. It's this, uh, uh, like, yeah, like this meta balls uh, kind of things and morph into each other and, and, uh, and go all the way. And it's the core of this whole identity. So that animation was made in, uh, in After Effects and it's the base of this whole, uh, uh, of this whole identity. Um, and this was also something that I sketched on a lot in processing. So this is again, not made in processing, this is After Effects. And I, I, I got it to a certain point where it was working, but you know, I never got it to the same level, I think as the, as the, uh, it's the after effects part. But what was quite interesting that we also thought maybe we can make something interactive. You know, maybe in one of these stores, we can make a huge floor where if you would step on it, uh, you know, the pressure of your foot would, um, uh, you know, would make a bigger or a smaller a circle like that. So these are some of the sketches that I did in, uh, in processing. In the end, uh, you know, it, it was just some early explorations and we went in a different route. They were never used, but uh, yeah. That doesn't really uh, that doesn't really matter because 
I think one of the really nice thing about coding is that there's not really an endpoint. So a lot of times you put a lot of time and effort into the first phase, like into the first part of the project where you try to set things up. But then if you are at a certain point, you can use that and go in so many different directions and keep uh, com coming back to a certain point and you know going uh, into uh, to a separate direction. Um, so for example, I, I use this base as uh, the for these animations that I made that are up on my uh, on my Instagram. I mean, it's not. Uh, uh, you know, like a big other project that we that came out of it, but it's just nice to to know that even if something ends in the sketching phase, you can still, especially in code, still use this uh, as a starting point for something new. Uh, this one I go a little bit more in depth because it's the project where actually processing played the biggest role in. I go through the first phase a little bit quickly because it's uh, otherwise a bit, of a, a bit of a long story, but it all started with the owners of these screens asking us to make screen savers for these screens because they had uh, ping wings and they wanted something else. Um, so I made this uh, text animation thing. I did not make it in processing for a reason that also Casey Rees uh, touched upon because we wanted to work with variable text, which is not really possible in processing, but it is possible in Python. So this is uh, uh, made in Drawbot, which is based on Python. So I hope processing will go into the Python direction because type animations are, uh, are perfect for this. But we made this tool where you can make all kinds of uh, textual animations with. We put the names of the cities in the in the city colors on the screen. So he's Rotterdam and he's Amsterdam. And we made uh, all kinds of these animations. The nice thing about that it was being coded is you could just type a name, choose a color, press a button, and you would have this you know, ready uh, to play uh, uh, video. So we could make a lot of them and we made a lot of them. I think there are around 80 different city names that we made. Um, but actually the start of demo came because of what was nice to see is that a lot of people started to film these things, uh, you know, around the Netherlands. And um, it's just something that you normally wouldn't do like film an advertisement screen, but people started sharing these with us on, uh, on, uh, uh, on Instagram. And what we really thought is it's such a nice, platform to design on, on these big, huge screens that are outside. It, it's a vertical uh, uh, orientation. We should give this opportunity to other designers as well. I mean, we see a lot of nice design on Instagram, but it's such a small little screen. We should use the screens and, uh, you know, put the designers on there. So we thought, why not initiate the world's largest motion design festival and show work from these designers all around the world. And we wanted to do it in a station because that's where it all started. We wanted to do it in Amsterdam Central Station because there are, uh, there are 18 of these advertisement screens and they have huge video walls. And we asked the owners of the screen, hey, can we take over these screens for 24 hours? So not show advertisement where you make your money with, but show designs from people all over the world. And they said, yes. The nice thing about doing this at the station, by the way, it was pre-COVID, is that you have 250,000 visitors in your, uh, in your exhibition or your uh, festival right away. So we suddenly had this festival in our hands and we needed an identity. And the thing about designing an identity for a motion design festival was of course that this whole identity should be something dynamic, should be something in that was moving. So here are some of the sketches that we did. This is a project where we really went all out on with uh, in the sketching phase. It's something that is really important in the Studio Dunbar where the sketching phase is like really important. We try to go in as many directions as we can and not only go in as many directions as we can, but also go as far as we can in that certain direction just to see you now how far can we uh, can we push it because you never know what comes out of uh, out of sketching so these are some crazy sketches that uh, you know are nice but didn't uh, didn't make it in the end stuff like this um, because for this identity the solution actually came in this uh, this app one of our designers uh, elvin is a motion designer he was sketching on his way back in the train and he was using this tool and he suddenly noticed this distortion tool within this uh, and this platform where you could put in a, an image. In this case, it's an image of a big D, the letter big D. Uh, and he could distort it from the middle without distorting the borders. And we really like this concept because that's also what you do on a screen. I mean, the borders are there, it doesn't distort, but you distort something you know, within this uh, screen. We thought this could be the base of our identity, but we had no idea how to make it. We could not recreate it in any other platform because all the distortion tools would just you know, distort your whole image. So what we did is just screen record uh, us playing around in the tool, put things next to each other. And when we had this, we thought yeah, this should be the identity. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, this became like, you know, the, the thing we wanted to achieve, but how would we do that? So again, we went to processing 
I made this grid that you could move around and then by filling this grid with a, uh, uh, with a chopped up uh, uh, image, because this is actually the input of this is a static image, it's a PNG image of a letter O. Suddenly you could make this whole, whole letter come alive and make it move in all the, the directions you want. You can play around with your mouse, you could click somewhere and it move in, uh, in a certain direction. So it was now so easy and quick to sketch with this. You would just put in any image that you want, click around on your screen and it would record the video. And then suddenly you now putting them together next in, uh, in uh, After Effects, you had this moving logo. Um, the designers went uh, crazy with the tool and added, uh, added some color because we had a lot of time, we made a whole alphabet. Uh, you could also do it for a complete word. You don't have to do it only for a letter because you know you can put in any image that you want. And we liked playing around with this tool so much, like it, it became like a really nice thing to do. We, uh, when I was coding it, I think 50% of the time I was just clicking around on the screen because it was so uh, satisfying to do. So that's also why we said, you know, let's make the whole website uh, have this uh, huge logo on the on the center. And because we were our own client, we could put the logo as big as possible because normally the logo should uh, be small left in the top. Uh, we put it on backgrounds of, uh, of other pages. Uh, we made it move uh, with your phone, with your accelerometer, which was still possible back then because there were no privacy issues. Now you can't do this anymore uh, without uh, problems. Anyway. The whole festival was in the end a big success. So we had these this huge screens with all uh, kinds of nice work. This is work actually from uh, uh, Sudo Young and Niels from Sudo Young is now also working at the studio. So something else good that came from this demo festival. And what was nice to see is that the train station transformed into this exhibition, like this motion design uh, uh, a museum almost, like shops suddenly turned into uh, uh, and museums and, and train platforms turned into this uh, museums and people from all over the world would you know, come and see, uh, see this amazing work. So it was amazing. Um, one of the last projects I wanna go through really quickly is uh, uh, the DNAD festival. And it was called Imagine Everything, the new festival. And um, actually that question for, the, for how we would design it was quite hard. Because what is hell for a designer is something is to design something for imagine because you know you can imagine everything and designing everything already says it. How would you design everything? Um, so we actually had a lot of um, well, we needed a lot of time in the sketching phase to come to a solution. So there are a ton of sketches I could easily fill a thirty-minute presentation with only the sketching for this uh, project. So where we started is using artificial intelligence and uh, actually even Vera came to our studio to talk with us because she, she does some amazing things with artificial intelligence. Um, in the end, we did not really use this because it's of course a bit hard to control and it also gave us some scary, uh, scary images. Uh, we played around with trying to recreate the same kind of feel but in, in, in motion software, I played around with code also to try to add a, a layer of text into it because uh, um, in the end, they also had to communicate uh, uh, something with text. Um, here are some other crazy sketches with text. Um, some more simple, uh, some more simple things. But in the end, when we started sketching stuff like this, it became a bit more interesting for us because we suddenly thought it's a festival about creativity. It's a festival where a lot of work is being shown. So shouldn't this identity, you know, revolve around the actual work? So this was a sketch I think made in Cinema 4D where. Uh, this grid would reveal uh, the work. Then something uh, uh, someone made in, in After Effects where this is almost like a timeline of images opening up. And this was a moment where I started being involved again also with code because I thought, hey, if we make you know this timeline of images opening up, can't we make this brush where you can draw on your screen and create any shape you want with the actual work? Um, we took it a step further. We thought, you know, let's put as many images as we can on the screen, opening it up, closing them. This is the first time I really made something working with noise. It's a bit uh, jittery, but uh, I don't know. I still like it. Uh, we added a second layer to it because at some point we also need to involve uh, text and uh, uh, we tried to do it like this. It was a horrible idea. Uh, the nice thing about coding is even if you make a mistake, you get some, some beautiful stuff. That's, I think, the nicest thing about coding is, uh, I mean, I can also always say that I uh, this was my end goal, uh, which it was not. Then I finally solved the, the jittery uh, noise thing, and we really liked this 
this type of easy motion. So instead of putting only one image, we thought let's put as many images as we can. And this, um, yeah, this is something that I still really like, but we were looking at this, this was kind of the end of the sketching phase. And we were saying to ourselves, I mean, it's nice, but is, does this convey the feeling of imagine and the feeling of everything? And for us, not really, because it's just a lot of images on the screen. It does, it tells you nothing about, you know, showing everything and, uh, and imagination. So actually we did a quite a big restart and we said, you know, what is imagine? Imagine this is the beginning of the ID. We should start with this imagine. You can imagine everything that you, you know, comes into your mind. So this imagine should be the starting point. So we literally made it the starting point. This is the, yeah, the sketch where like the, the where everything uh, revolves around. And from that imagine we could, does it work? Yeah. We could stretch out in this case, this everything and make a, the longest logo that we ever made. But actually this imagine could suddenly be the starting point of literally everything that we wanted. So with all these crazy sketches with big, Im like with a big grid of images and things moving around, actually this was our solution for this imagine everything, something a lot more toned down and, and typographic and actually simple in a way. And it resulted in, uh, for example, a trailer that I will show you now. And in the end, also for like for a lot of printing things, we did 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 open up a lot of opportunities to make you know crazy things. And what's nice to see is with sketching, it's never for nothing. Like we did all the sketching with these crazy uh, image grids, but in the end, it did came back in, for example, the the closing animation that we made for the festival itself. So I, what I think is, is nice about this is that, I mean, it's always good to sketch as many things as you can and you never know what comes out of it. So even if the solution was not, was not in that, the sketches that I showed, we did you know, come back to it and, and could finalize the project. I'm almost done. Uh, just some really quick examples of, uh, of some stuff that... Uh, um, sometimes we do things that are a little bit more applied with uh, processing, which I really like. So this is a tool that we made for uh, identity where which we actually gave to the client. They could make this, uh, the shapes out of all these uh, little shapes. We use this tool for, this is the printing tool, but we also have a motion tool because you know you can make these growing things with it. So sometimes actually coding is the goal and it's the end result in, uh, in things we do. Uh, also for this project where we made identity for uh, for Club Brugge in Belgium, a professional football club, Christopher uh, in our studio made this. And he was using these big arrows that you see in the background, these big, big blue arrows that was like the base of this identity and they were on all elements that we created. And then he said, you know, I have this, this arrow, but I actually want to make it out of a lot of smaller arrows that are the same, like I want to rasterize it in arrows. And of course you can do that in, 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 in Illustrator or something, but... He wanted to play around with it, try as many things as possible, it's a small, big. So I said, oh yeah, I can make a processing tool for that. So we made a processing tool where you could make this arrow and just you know, uh, make it in as many little arrows as you wanted. And the nice thing about having this is in the end, this uh, ended up on the, on the bus. So thank you processing for making all of this possible that I was able to, uh, to make designs for a professional football club uh, players bus and all the rest that I shared. Thank you.
Sander, that was mind blowing. Awesome stuff. Thank you. I'm super excited. Amazing work. I mean, I follow the work of Studio Dumbro since uh, quite a long time already, but you know, you really crush it. It's a, that's a great talk. You really uh, should do this more often. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, this was maybe a bit long. I didn't really practice it before, but uh, well. Thanks. No worries. It was great. It was really super inspirational. And I love these aesthetics. I think you have a very, very yeah, concise way of designing at Studio Dunbar. And it must be great fun to work in such a cool agency. So, um, yeah. It is. And I mean, the nice thing is that we still do the same thing as we did before. We just have different tools to you know, mm -hmm. do it. So, uh, yeah. I got to fix yeah. my lighting. It's... It's, it's getting dark. quite late already. Yeah, it's getting dark here in Germany. I guess for some of you, it's still day, but I have to, you know, I don't, still don't have good video lights. I, that's something I have to, to buy uh, soon. Um, anyway, um, Sandra, there are some questions. One of them is quite, let's say, I think quite um, interesting because I just heard that kind of question often. So, um, Interactive in, Interactivist says, Sander, do you think processing has an aesthetic in the sense that it is easier to do some stuff and harder do, to do some other stuff? And he also says, it sometimes feels a, as if a lot of stuff made in processing looks similar. Yes. Well, I think that's a good point because we actually say that a lot is that there sometimes things look like processing, like it has this processing look to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the black background and uh, I don't know, you see it and you think, hey, that's made in, in processing. Yeah. I think it changed a little bit the last couple of years because, I don't know, like the whole coding thing evolved and, you know, computers got more powerful. So there's just more opportunities. But uh, I mean, if you look at my horrible uh, projects that I showed that I did during school, they they were all had this kind of processing aesthetic a little bit. Um, but what now helps me a lot and why I really push on this collaboration thing where it's always my advice to people if they ask me you know do you have some advice it's collaborate with other people because what helps me a lot is that a lot of these things that i make in processing don't start out in processing mm -hmm. and that's the the cool thing black processing is sometimes the right tool to to get to the end results mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you know it's it's not processing it's another tool so it's a lot of times it's a designer coming up with a concept or a sketch or something that they want mm -hmm. then i can Create, like recreate in processing. And a lot of times they're also quite uh, picky on how it should look. So it should work in a certain way. So sometimes I have to be, have to be really precise. Mm -hmm. And how I try to code is to be really, uh, like I really want to be in control. I really want to know upfront what I'm going to make. So I'm not really this experimental, just try some things and, and be mm -hmm. amazed what comes out of it. But I sketch it out and I do a lot of things on paper and I want to make it exactly like that. Because of a lot of time, I make something for a designer to work with. And I think then, I mean, that's not the only way to make uh, nice things in processing. It's just my, my way. But uh, yeah. I really like making something for someone else to design with and have this uh, back and forth because they design something. Then they come into, they have another question like, hey, I'm now designing this, but can you also make it like this? Or sometimes it's the other way around because I'm coding it and suddenly I have the feeling, hey, I now made this. And technically, it's quite easy to also make this, but which they didn't uh, think about so mm -hmm. then it becomes just interesting uh, and back and forth. And then, you know, you can uh, maybe out, uh, outrun this, this processing aesthetic. In yeah, I would also like to answer this question. Uh, I think it really depends on what kind of stuff you learn and how much you practice. So, of course, there are some things, that, some quick wins in processing that you can achieve very easily because, you know, some people like me or other people just created specific tutorials on things. but. From my point of view, processing is a generalist tool that can be used for literally anything. So it has a, you know, you basically can program anything you can imagine. And that's the that's the superpower of programming in, in general, right? So if you are able to create a system that, you know, or you are with processing, you are able basically to, to really develop things that, that look completely different than what we see today in the processing scene, I guess. And um, yeah, it really depends on how people educate other people and um, yeah, and what kind of materials are out there, right? Yeah, no, exactly. And, and I think 
thing like a simple really simple example what what changed a lot of things for me because we make a lot of motion work is for example just adding easing into my processing thing like there's this library uh, called ami which yeah, i use a lot cool. where you can it's yeah so cool it's yeah. so good but you could just pick the easing and just you know say i want this element for, for here and this kind of easing but that that changes yeah. the whole thing because it suddenly becomes less mechanical and, and becomes like a real uh, uh, animated thing and just these simple things that you that you learn by you know doing and and by trying out a lot of things absolutely uh, are really helpful yeah this is a, this is a very important tip i think the ani library by benedict course is so amazing it's so well i am not really sure if it works well with processing 4 i still have to find that out but i guess my sketches still work so <laughs> okay they still work so yeah. you already use processing 4 yeah, I, f I thought I had to before this. Uh, I, I didn't know if I got to speak with uh, Casey Rios, and I thought if I didn't use uh, processing before, I would, you know, be, I have to be admit really angry. I have to admit that I'm on a Linux computer right now. I use Ubuntu operating system on my computer here. So I also have a Mac, but I uh, really enjoy exploring Linux and open source software. So that's why I just use an Ubuntu system for my whole uh, e-learning process. And um, I still use Processing 3, but I definitely will take a look into Processing 4 for Ubuntu. So it is a very edge case, right? Uh, up processing until now, 4. all my <laughs> works in, uh, in uh, I didn't really try it, you know, but uh, everything I opened uh, works. Um, 